Without further ado, I would like to bring up our next speaker, David Morrison, Searching for Life in the Universe. Thank you for being with us. Please forgive the delay. Thank you. May I? I'm, I'm a hugger. May of I? Hug it again. <laughs> I just, I just love hugging all these smart people today. Thank right. you. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me. It's the first time I've been to one of these. Uh, I'm an astrobiologist, which means I study life in the universe. Um, I started out as a planetary scientist. I was Carl Sagan's first graduate student. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk today about the search for life in the universe. And let me start with what is, I guess, the bad news. The most exciting problems for astrobiologists and many others too are how did life originate on our planet and are we alone? That is, is there life elsewhere in the universe? And the fact is, I can't answer either of those questions. <laughs> we simply don't know how life started on Earth. We know how the pieces came together. We understand about proteins and chemical evolution. Uh, we understand that we are all descended from a common ancestor that started more than four billion years ago. But the actual putting together of a living thing, something that can reproduce and metabolize, remains a mystery but obviously one that we think will ultimately succumb to scientific investigation. Often you hear about evidence for life beyond the Earth. And there again, the sober fact is we have no credible evidence for life anywhere in the universe except on our own planet. Doesn't mean we don't think there's life elsewhere. The universe is teeming with planets, many of them habitable, almost surely inhabited but we haven't actually found any evidence. Well, I would like to very quickly run through some slides just to show you some of the places that I'm going to be talking about where we search for life. Are they up? Well, not the slides I have here, but they're up. Okay, can we go back to the first one? I'm going to start with Mars. As everybody knows, Mars is, uh, is the place we think of first when we think of another inhabited planet. And this is just some, some slides to show you that Mars is in fact a place. I mean, it's real. The spacecraft that we have there now are telling us all sorts of cool things. This is an orbital view of an area that clearly has been eroded by liquid water. The next slide is on the ground. It looks like a real place. This is from the, uh, one of the rovers on the ground, and we see evidence of geology, of sediment, of windblown sandstone, of layers of gravel, just the kind of things we would expect on a planet that had a history similar to our own. Next. Hmm, takes a while, doesn't it? Hmm, should we keep going or just or wait? because I don't want to take your and my valuable time. Okay, that's another view from the current Curiosity rover, and you can see the layers of sediment. Those could very easily trap evidence, fossil evidence of ancient life. Next. Another view on the surface. It's a real place. It's become very real to us. It's not just a point of light in the sky. Next. This is a view from above of sand dunes on Mars. Uh, those strange black things are black sand driven by Martian winds. Next, please. And another view from above with mostly windblown dust. Mars is only about half the size of Earth. It has a much thinner atmosphere. It simply doesn't have the gravity to hold on to the atmosphere we have, but it does have enough atmosphere to blow sand. Next. I'm now going to move out to Europa, the satellite of Jupiter, uh, probably Jupiter's most interesting moon, which is covered with ice above an ocean of liquid water. Next, please. 
When we look closely, we see that that ice is wrinkled and broken and certainly suggests to us that it is not terribly thick and that we could, in principle, get to the liquid water below the surface. Next. Another view much closer of this strange surface that is reminiscent of what you would see some places on Earth if you looked down on frozen ocean. Next. And even closer. We're now talking about the kind of picture that you could, uh, you could put a ship in, for instance, that would show up. And then now going out to the Saturn system, one of our newer places of interest is the moon Enceladus, which again has a surface that's very smooth that we now believe is an ice surface floating on a global ocean of liquid water. Next. The amazing thing there is that water is escaping through geysers. And here is a place where if we're looking for water and looking for what might be able living in water, we could go with a spacecraft without landing and sample it. Next. And just another view, this is the part of the planet, those stripes, where those geysers are coming from. We don't understand how it works, but presumably the liquid water is close enough to the surface to escape and be potentially sampleable. So let me now put the slides aside, turn the lights up, and quickly run through the way we are looking for life in the universe. Mars, although it's not hospitable now because it has a small atmosphere and is very cold, shows the kind of evidence that I was showing you pictures of that it once had a, a, a climate much more like Earth. Blue sky, rain fell, there was at least intermittently water on the surface. And those are the conditions we would associate with life. Whether there's any life now, we don't know. Whether life ever began there, we don't know. It's one of the most exciting questions for astronomers and astrobiologists. Think what it would mean if we found there was no life on Mars in spite of its similar past history to Earth. That would be very pessimistic. That would make us think maybe life really is unusual. If we found life there and it was based on RNA and DNA like ours, we would probably conclude that rocks with life were exchanged back and forth between Earth and Mars early in solar system history. And we would be sampling very distant cousins of ours, life that had had four billion years of independent evolution. If we find life there that is different, fundamentally different in its chemistry, then we can truly believe that there was a second origin of life in our solar system and that life is potentially much more common in the cosmos. Now Mars is easy to deal with because we can get to it, it has a solid surface, we can send rovers, we can dig holes, we can explore it. And while we haven't found any critical evidence yet, it's reasonable to think that we will in the next few years or at least be able to have a better answer to the question, is there life or was there life on Mars? If we step out to Europa, the ice-covered satellite of Jupiter, the amazing thing there is that we now understand that below that ice is a liquid ocean water with more liquid water in it than in the oceans of the Earth. Perfect sort of place we might expect to find life because water is the one common element on all living things on Earth. But it's below this damned layer of ice that may be as much as 10 kilometers thick. And it's really hard to imagine how we could land there with a spacecraft or what we could do to see what strange, mysterious things might be living in that ocean, in the deep, in the black, below that ice cover. It'd be wonderful to do it, but I can't say that I think any space program on Earth has that within its capability in the next few decades. Then we go out to Enceladus, the satellite of Saturn, with the spray of material coming out. It again has a subsurface ocean of water. But now we have the potential to sample some of that water, not with any spacecraft we have now, but with the next generation of spacecraft that could go out there. And finally, in our solar system, there's Titan, the giant moon of Saturn, which in so many ways resembles the Earth. It has rain that falls. It has lakes but they're made of methane and ethane. It's a hydrocarbon world with a temperature so low that there could never be liquid water. 
Is that potentially habitable? It's a very open question, but we would love to go there. We'd love to look and see if it's possible that life constructed differently from ours, but still carbon-based, might exist there. Leaving our solar system, which clearly has many potentially interesting destinations, we now have a whole new field of exoplanets. As I'm sure you've all read in the last three years, the Kepler spacecraft has discovered more than 3,000 planets orbiting other stars. And just yesterday was announced the first discovery of an Earth-sized planet within the Goldilocks zone of its star, that is, at a distance from the star where water, liquid water, could be expected on its surface. The first real Earth analogs elsewhere. You might say, well, we found 3,000 planets and only one like that. But when you do the statistics and, question, and, and correct for possible biases in how we're examining it, you come to the awesome conclusion that there are between 20 billion and 40 billion Earth-sized planets in our galaxy alone, to say nothing of the billions of galaxies beyond. It's very hard to imagine that some of those worlds aren't inhabited. But indeed, there may not be billions of inhabited worlds with life of some sort. It's also very hard to figure out how we will find out. These are places hundreds or thousands of light years away. We'll never go there with a spacecraft. What we will do is build bigger and better telescopes in space. Now, a telescope in space can't look and see if there's a critter on the surface. But it can measure the atmosphere and look for chemicals in the atmosphere that are so-called biosignatures, that would at least suggest the chemicals came from life as opposed to other non-life sources, as on our Earth we have. Oxygen and methane in our atmosphere are both biosignatures. If we could build a next generation of telescopes and look at these exoplanets that are the right size and the right temperature, we would love to analyze their atmospheres. If we found one that had methane and oxygen, we would probably say, Eureka, that is another living world. There's a third approach that you all know, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Everything I've said till now would focus probably on microbes. Microbes are the primary life forms on our planet, for the first two billion years of our planet, we had only microbes. Even today, they dominate in chemistry, in the way the planet's system works. The microbes are the real inhabitants of the planet, and we're just the uh, visitors. Uh, so we've been talking until now about probably looking for microbial life that might or might not have developed into, into creatures like ourselves. But if it did, if on some planet evolution proceeded to the point of producing intelligence, and we don't know if it would, and if that intelligent were, intelligence were technological and had some strange inclination to build radios, and we don't know if it would, most intelligent creatures on our planet, like the cetaceans, have not built radios. But if they did, and then they were inclined for some reason to transmit a signal, we could detect it. We don't have sensitive enough, sensitive enough radio receivers yet to detect just what might be their random communications, cell phones, et cetera, if they existed on that planet. But we do have the sensitivity to detect any other civilization that was intentionally broadcasting a signal. I cannot possibly predict when we might succeed. Literally, it could be tonight. The telos some of the telescopes that are doing study searches could find an intelligent signal at any moment, but they haven't yet. And there are so many assumptions in trying to calculate the possibility of an intelligent civilization on some other world that there's no way to think about the probabilities. But these are all tremendously exciting avenues of research to look at the planets in our own solar system, 
that might be capable of supporting life or have done so in the past, to look at literally billions of exoplanets for evidence in their atmospheres that they might be the home of life, or if we're really lucky, they'll send us a message and we'll skip all this other stuff about astronomy and chemistry and find out directly that there's intelligent life. I feel that it's quite reasonable to imagine within the next generation, say, within certainly the lives of most of us, that any one of those three approaches could succeed. Maybe all of them, that we will succeed for the first time in answering that fundamental question of are we alone? And at the same time, by studying any other exo-life, we will gain a much better perspective on the origin of life on our own planet, to see if we are rare or common, if the kind of chemistry that led to life here might happen other places. It's really an exciting, cool thing to do. And I think we, we can put aside all the strange mythology and all the UFO claims and all this other stuff and focus on real science because real science will give us the answers. In conclusion, just a small personal note. It is indeed ironic that I have been sued along with a bunch of other astrobiologists and planetary scientists for denying the presence of life on Mars and Europa and the Moon because we believe life could only have formed on Earth and that belief is based entirely on Genesis. I don't think that case will get very far in the courts, but it's a little bit weird. Anyway, thank you for the invitation to speak here.